you really have to be careful about sitting in the front row when kids' church is dismissed because <laughs> the kids just want to get down to kids' church. And if you're in your way, <laughs> tough to be you. <laughs> and the parents, they want to go down and get the kids down to kids' church too, so it's a really rough time. <laughs> so, awesome. <clears throat> well, it's Memorial Day weekend. Welcome to Milestone Church, and uh, this weekend, uh, there's a lot of gatherings and a lot of vacation time because you have a three-day weekend that sometimes you push into four days or whatever, and a uh, great time to get away. And really, this weekend is a, a weekend to remember those that have given their lives in, in service in our country, and uh, so uh, we honor those who have served and who are currently serving as well in the military and um, and so we remember the lives that were given to, for freedom's sake, essentially. Uh, when we look at Memorial Day, we're remembering those that are past. We're not remembering those that are technically serving. It's remembering those that are past and um, those that have given their lives. And um, oftentimes, we, we stop there. And today, I want to dig a little bit deeper. In order to give your life for something, there's got to be someone that's wanting to take your life. Does that make sense? Right? Okay, so in a war kind of a sense, the, the reality is we, we have a bigger question. Why were they at war anyway? Like, who started the fight? And why did we have to send troops, or why did people have to defend? Why is it? Because people don't die for just nothing, correct? And so we have to ask some of those questions. Today, I want to dive a little deeper as we're in the series, Who Really Needs God? And I want to walk through that as well, um, because there's a very important correlation between what uh, war is all about and where we come from, where we're going. So in very simple explanations, because you're extremely smart, but I'm trying to make it very, uh, like, bring it down to your fingertips and make it very practical for you. Here's what war is. It's one bully... Or one strong person that wants control over someone or something else. Does that make sense? Okay, so it could be that someone wants control over someone else's life or someone else's property. And so war is one person who's the bully who you, you look and they say, okay, here's what I want. I want what you have. I want the gold. I want the silver. I want the land. I want the religious rights, or I want this, that, and the other thing, or I want freedom even. And so there's people that are kind of bullying their way in or have an agenda that's greater than the other person. And so they don't care who they run over to get to where they're going. They're just going to go there. Now, Within that, if you have a bully on the playground, just for kicks, and I know for a lot of you, it's been a while since you've been on the playground, but you understand what I'm saying. Okay, so if you have a bully on the playground that's bullying other people, that's, that's trying to hurt other people, what do you do? You do nothing, obviously. <laughs> what do you do? Do you do anything? Speak out. Okay, if you see someone else's kid beating up on your kid in the playground, what do you do? Do you just sit there and like, nah, serves you right. Should have cleaned your room yesterday. God's getting you back for that. Is that what you say? Okay, nobody really does, okay? But in, sometimes in church world, we actually interpret things that way, but that's not, how, that's not accurate. Here's the reality. If someone's picking on someone else, what you want to do and what you should do, and studies have shown that people don't often do this, but that's a whole other story, is you should step in and do something. So you have one person who's the strong person, assumed that that person's a bully, and so one strong person's picking on the weak person, wanting what they have, and then there's another person, a third party that's watching and says, I want to step in. American history has a lot of this going on where we're the step in inners, okay? Is that right? Step or inners? Okay, good. We're close. Okay, so you follow where I'm saying. Now, instead of me giving history of American and war and things like that, <laughs> I didn't want to make a mistake, so I thought I would get Keith to come up, and uh, he would share some history of what war looks like in America, where we've been there, and he's going to share a few things um, about the history there, okay? Okay, so this is the second time in two weeks I'm up front, and Sorry. I think I should take his paycheck. No, just kidding. Um, all right, so... America and war. Um, we've been around for 242 years since our Declaration of Independence. Um, after signing the Declaration of Independence, America was involved in war, obviously. Um, 
and it was actually in war for on and off for about 90 years. Um, obviously, with the Declaration of Independence and our Revolutionary War and the War of 1812, we fight England, all right? And that was basically our thoughts of protecting our land or obtaining our independence, all right? Um, but we struggled for 90 years on and off with others, um, but mainly also with ourselves, um, um, which culminated in the Civil War. In 1868, it was declared that Memorial Day would start. Uh, May 30th, 1868 was the first Memorial Day, um, and it was uh, Remembrance Day as well. Um, and basically, those 90 years were mostly land battles, get off of my land. Uh, that's the reason for those wars. The um, federal government almost always found themselves to be on the winning side uh, during, the, during those 90 years. And the culmination of the Civil War is, um, is rough because we lost 625,000 men during that war. And that's just the uh, military. That's not including the civilians who also died. The uh, military deaths equaled 2% of our population. Um, that's a lot. And when you're thinking about 2% today, that would equal about 6.5 million people or slightly less than a million and a half who live in New York City right now. Um, so that would be all five boroughs of New York City. Um, that's crazy amounts of life, 625. We have not had that in America since. We have not had a war that has lost that many lives. Um, but... At the start of the 20th century, all right, what did you call it? Getting, getting, getting inners? I don't know. Getting in. Yeah, I know. <laughs> all right. At first, we were isolationists. That's the, uh, that's the opposite of getting inners. Um, <laughs> and, um, but we were drawn into two great world wars, all right, World War I and World War II. Um, our involvement in World War I was late um, by you know, the standards of the rest of the world. Um, and we lost, even though we were in it for a year and a half, we lost 100,000 men. That does not compare even close to what the world lost, which was 17 million. Um, the punishment was placed on Germany. The reason for that war was it started off as an assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Um, and that war took literally the entire world by storm. Um, and it was the wave of colonialism. Everyone's trying to get more land. And um, we just didn't want any land. We were isolationists. We were you know, content with taking care of the Western Hemisphere. Uh, we were trying to get control of all of that. We didn't have to worry about the rest of Europe. Anyway, the punishment was placed on Germany, who for the next, whatever it is, 15 years, basically had to figure out how to get by. Their money was worthless. Um, people actually used to burn their money in Germany for um, fuel of their houses uh, because it was totally worthless. It would just be um, chunks and chunks and chunks of money uh, just being burned. Um, and so we had an individual who rose to power in Germany and took them by storm and help their economy start to grow. Um, and that led us to World War II with Adolf Hitler. Um, the um, U.S. does not arrive until the third year of that war uh, after we are attacked by Pearl Harbor. The reason for that war, again, we have a megalomaniac who is out there to get uh, control of the world. America did lose a lot of men. Um, not nearly as much as the Civil War. We lost 418,000 men. Um, but the world was shocked when they um, had a death total of 70 million people. Um, but U.S. came in, and we helped really secure a win uh, for the Allied powers. The U.S. was hailed as a hero, um, and um, our economy boomed uh, drastically. Uh, in the second half of the 20th century, we were no longer isolationists. We were the getting-inners, and that is called interventionalists. 
Um, America took on the role of protector of democracy and fighter against terrorism. Um, we fought communism and terrorism. Uh, we fought in the Korean War. Uh, the Korean War, we lost about uh, 40,000. Uh, then we also fought in the Vietnam War, which is 58,000. And this is main purpose. These, the reasons for these wars were to combat communism. Uh, we just did not see the world or the politics of the world in the same view. Um, then we also have the um, 27 years of the wars that we have been fighting the last 27 years, uh, which are um, because of in the, in the desert and Afghanistan. Uh, we have lost a total uh, since 1991, 1990, 7,000 lives. Um, Vietnam, we lost about 58,000. Um, so that gives you an idea that we have started to scale down uh, the number of lost lives. Uh, the death tolls have diminished, but, uh, and I'm going to close with this and Bill will transition, um, countries wanted us to be the hero. They wanted us to be the savior to take care of the problems, um, but we have not met their expectations. Um, and now you have individuals who do not like us. And that leads us to where we are today um, with, you know, what we have. And that's why we celebrate Memorial Day, uh, because of all these lives. And if you added up all the lives lost in all of our wars, uh, they still do not match the Civil War. Um, we're, we're close. We're, we're close, but we're still not at that same number. So, Bill? Awesome. Thanks, Keith. Hey, Here's my point. Why would I do something like that and have him give you a bunch of history? Here's the reason. The point of the message is people make lousy gods. Does that make sense? It's that in most cases, most of the wars are formed by people that are trying to be God in other people's lives, and they're trying to control or have the life ordered in the way they want. And in America, we've done our best in different ways to try to intervene. Some are good and some are bad, and we would agree or disagree uh, with different things. And here's the reality. In the world, we're ordering our life in the way that we think is best. That's the big deal. Now, if you're stepping away from God, here's my point, and here's what I'm driving at today. If you're stepping away from God, then you're stepping away from an order that God has designed for you. Because if you're walking with God, then you're walking in a way that you say, okay, this is God's order, this is the way God wants me to do things, and so I'm going to follow God's plan. But if you're stepping away from God and you're saying, I don't know if I really need God, then what you're doing is you're saying, I'm willing to, I'm desiring to step away from the order that God chooses to have in my life, and I want to order my life in the way that I choose instead. And so here's what that looks like. I have a whole list of those because I, I think at, at this point you're like, okay, I kind of get it, but what's that really look like? So here's a list. If there is no God, then, there, then here's what we are left with. It's my order, my order, it's my way, or it's your order, right? Or it's nature's order. So who gets to win? Listen, if you've been married for any length of time, like 15 minutes or more, right? You understand that you have my order or your order. What do you do with the socks? How do you fold the socks? How do you do the laundry? How do you do the dishes? And how do you cook the food and all those other things? And you've got my order, your order, and then there's nature's order, and we're not sure what that means yet, okay? And then you have others beside that. Now you have philosopher's order. You have people that they philosophize about life, and they say, okay, this is what I think, and they're really intelligent, Socrates. And you have people that are really, really smart, and they're like, here's my philosophy, and, and maybe we should follow this order. Or you have an educator's order. Don't say anything bad about Keith. But you have educators, you know, and you have people in colleges and universities and high schools that are now making these theories. I mean, you have all kinds of things, and this is reordering our life even today when you look at educators or psychology, psych, psychologist orders, where you look at psychology and say, well, it goes back to this, or it's this emotional, or this, whatever, and you have different orders there. And we just continue on with others. How about the clans order? Oh, now we're getting a little deeper, aren't we? Because this is a philosophy. This is a way of thinking. This is their way of going about things, or Nazi order, or street order. Have you thought about this? 
It's all vying for control. It's vying for my order versus your order. Majority order, that's a big one in America. That if you have the majority of people that agree to a certain thing, then it must be the right thing. That's why polls are so important in America. They, they do so much poll research and poll data because what they want to prove is the majority is going this way, so you might as well. And mom always said, if everybody jumped off the bridge, yep, you know how it goes. How about the rich order? You, you have people that, because you have more money, then you must be the one that's in charge. Or the power order, I'm more powerful, I'm stronger than you, so therefore I should be in control of you. Or parent order, <laughs> that's a good one. Or kid order, that's an interesting one. Or the worst of all, religious order. It's all about control. It's who's in charge. Who gets to say this is the way it's supposed to be? And then the question is, how did you arrive at those thoughts? I mean, what told you that it was right to fold your laundry and put it away? Mom did, I know. And grandmom did before that. And you always make your bed after you get up because that's, that's just the way you're supposed to be. Cleanliness is next to? That's not in the Bible, just to give you an idea, okay? <laughs> But here's the reality. We determine what is right and wrong based on our thoughts or based on the majority or based on who's richer or who's more powerful or based on the philosophy or the psychology or whatever it is, the most popular books, and we determine the orderliness of our lives based on those kinds of things. But none of those or all of those can be separate from God's order. Do you see that? And we have one more that I didn't discuss yet that I want to go, go into a little bit because we've already talked about this a, a bit before, and I want to ex extrapolate a couple ideas out of this. Science, science has decided that biology is the new God. Over the past hundred years, this has been a growing thing. And, and when you look at the wars and the amount of people, amount of deaths, partly the, the, the reason that there's not as many deaths as there were a hundred years ago is because of the improvements with science and medicine. Do you know that? Okay, they, they say Abraham Lincoln probably would not have died from his wounds if they would have done the right thing. Think about that but because they didn't have the right medicine. So science isn't all bad, but here's what science has done, and a lot of philosophy has done. Science says the new God is biology. So here's the reality. Everything is ordered through biology, which has evolved over millions of years through the natural selection process. So what we have today is what has survived by being stronger than the thing that does not exist. So I find it interesting that we defend the animals that are going extinct when it is supposedly part of the natural selection process. It's just an interesting like, conundrum, in my opinion. Here's what Stephen Hawking said. We've talked about him before. Stephen Hawking, Hawking said back in 1990, he said, The terror that stalks my mind is that we have arrived on the scene because of evolution. Because of naturalistic selection, and natural selection assumes natural rejection. Do you see that? There's an assumption that natural rejection is part of natural selection. You're selecting this, and by selecting this, you're rejecting this. He goes on further, and he says, which means we have arrived here because of our aggression. Do you see that? If you're following along with, if you're taking a step away from God, here's what you're stepping into. You're stepping into a world that says, by war, we figure out who's best. You're essentially putting a, uh, a stamp of approval on war. Very simply put. I like what Andy Stanley says. He says within this conversation, there is no basis for human dignity when everything is reduced to biology. So essentially, the one that controls the world is the one that is stronger than everyone else. So in science, war is part of nature's plan then. I see things a little bit different. I see war coming from people that are trying to be God in the lives of other people. The problem is that people make a lousy God. There should be like a bunch of amens right there, right? And whether you've experienced or seen this in, a, in the world setting or narrow the vision all the way down to 
the home you're living in or the home you grew up in or the neighbors you know or the friends that you're aware of where you have one person trying to be God in the other person's life and they're being a lousy God. And you've experienced it. It could be a boss. It could be, it's wherever. It's all over the place, isn't it? And you would agree, I think you would agree, that people make a lousy God. Because there are ways, their agendas may, are, are not always the best for everyone involved, and certainly not best for you. So people have been playing God from the beginning of time, and so I want to trace this out a little bit and uh, be able to see where it comes from and where it is today. So if you're following along in your Bibles, go back to, with me to the very, very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> I recognize the dialogue and the struggle that many people have with creation and evolution, and I recognize that, and that's a deeper conversation that I'm not diving into today. Not that I'm not willing to. I'd be glad to do that. But So, so Genesis chapter 1 gives the account of creation, the seven-day creation that God did on the earth and throughout the whole universe. And then you get into Genesis chapter 2, and he re- kind of does a refresher of that. And then Genesis chapter 3, is which, which is where we are today, you have Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And while they're in there, there are some interesting things that are happening. And so God gives them <clears throat> one rule that they're supposed to keep, Right? And so as they're there, chapter 3, verse 1, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, if you're wondering what page it is, on my Bible, it's page number 2. Okay, so it says, now the serpent, and the serpent, we understand based on um, looking more extensively at this, this is Satan in the form of a serpent. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other beasts of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, so the serpent now speaking to the woman, Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Here's what he's doing. He's challenging her to take a second look at what God said. Wait, 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 hold on a second. Did God really say this? Did did God actually say to you? Did you, wait a second, did he really, really say this to you? Can you believe this? Shall not eat of any of the fruit of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, if you rewind a little bit, you'll see that God never said, don't touch it. That's a legalistic statement. Here's what a legalist is. A legalist says, you need to step away from this. You need to not get close to this. So what we'll do is we'll set up a fence that's 100 feet away from it so that you never get close to it. And so what happens is we say, my spirituality is based on staying staying at the fence line instead of sinning. Well, that's not what God ever called us to. God's called us to a spirituality. It looks like a relationship with him. It's not about the fence at all. And so that's a whole other conversation as well. I've got these all side conversations going on, but I'll keep it down to here. So then verse 4, the serpent said to the woman. So he engages her in a conversation. Now he's going a little further, and she explains. He's just saying, is this what God said? And now, yeah, here's what God said. And um, verse 4, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. What he's doing is he's saying, God's a liar, You're not going, listen, listen, listen. I know that's what you heard. You think you heard that, but here's what God said. God, he's totally messed up. Here's what the reality. You're not going to die. It's not going to be that bad for you. You think it's going to be bad? Come on, really? (laughs) Listen, that adulterous relationship, don't worry, it's not that bad. Spending money where you shouldn't, it's not that bad. Don't worry about that. I know you got to lie a little bit here and there. Don't worry about it. It's not that bad. I know God said this, but he's a little bit messed up. I mean, he's the holy roller after all, right? He says, you will not surely die, verse 5, for God knows. Listen, here's what God knows. And I'm just, I want to enlighten you to something that you need to see here. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like, God, knowing good and evil. Here's what he's doing very simply. He is challenging her to reorder her world, her terms, instead of God's terms. 
He's saying, listen, I know that God said this over here. I know that God told you this over here, but God knows that, that here's the reality. God knows you're not going to really die. God knows he's holding something good from you. God knows, listen, he's just trying to make life really challenging for you. God knows all of that, and so here's what he's trying to do. God, God needs to be reordered, and you should be in charge of things in a right way. Okay? Here's what Satan's trying to do. He's trying to reorder her world. He's trying to say your order, order, the way that you want to order things is, would be much better than the way that God wants to order things. The challenge from the very beginning is who's in charge. That's the reality. And we live in a world that I would say is ordered by anything but God. So we end up with people that call evil good. Right? When you view things on television... When you view things in the newspaper, when you view things on Facebook or wherever you're viewing things, you see a world that calls evil good. So then you, you follow this down through, and she follows through. She does eat of the forbidden fruit, and by doing that, she brings death and sin upon all of mankind. They didn't experience death prior to that and wouldn't have, but because of sin, they experience death, and so they begin to fall apart, if you will, at that point in time, and then they die years later. They do have children and children's children, and you follow that all the way out, and you can see how this works. And here's the next generation, Genesis chapter 4. And this is so important to see this, because here's where we miss a whole lot of context as to where war comes from. Genesis chapter 4. So here, let's just pause for a second. They were in a perfect place. There was no sin. There was no competition. There was no shopping mall to go shopping for clothing, because they didn't need any, Right? There, there was no issues with debt. There was no comparison. Here's the reality. You had one sin. There was one thing that entered in, and it broke everything down. And so God said, I'm casting you out of the Garden of Eden. Why? Because the tree of life is in there, and you can't eat of that because that would totally mess things up. You'd live forever being sinful. That would be terrible. So we fast forward into the next chapter here, and they have generation of kids. And within that generation, you have Adam uh, and Eve having Cain and Abel. And you can see in verse 1 and 2 how they named them, and it's a very fascinating study, but we won't get into that. That's another side story. So in the course of time, verse 3, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought, the, brought of the firstborn of his flock and of the fat, their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. Now, listen, if you're bringing an offering to the Lord, God's interested in something that is not leftovers, but something that's first fruit. That's the very beginning. That's the top of everything. Okay? So if you bring leftovers in, you say, hey, listen, okay, God, from a financial, just this makes it really practical and easy. If you say, God, I'm giving you what's left over. You know, I went to Wawa this morning, and I got my coffee, and I got my donuts, and I got everything covered, and I got, oh, I got $7 left in my pocket, and I, here, I'm going to give that to you, and that's my leftovers. God says, I don't want it. I'm not interested in that. If you're going to give financially to God, God says, prior to spending anything, give first to him. That's a financial discussion, Okay. In that, in all of our life, in every resource we have, in our time, in our energy, in everything that we have, we should be giving our first fruit. And so it's not me that's saying it. It's what God's saying. So here's what he's saying to Cain and Abel, and specifically to Cain, because Abel gave his offering, and, and God says, this is good because you gave your first fruit. And, and Cain did, and he says, hey, listen, this is a problem. Your heart's not right. Because here's what you did. You went... You went over to the cemetery and you grabbed some flowers that were almost dead that somebody put on a grave and you gave that to your wife. And your wife knows you were there. Do you catch it? Listen, listen. Here, here's what you did. You went, you, you're trying to be engaged to her by giving her a cubic zirconia piece of diamond junk. And that gold, that's not really gold anyway. Look, she might think you're a nice guy, but that's just leftovers. That's not quality. Your, your heart's not in it. We'd be okay with saying that, right? That's all God's saying. He's saying, do you love me? Give me your first fruit. And Cain, Cain, hearing this from God, and here's what he does. He gets very angry. 
You ever have somebody say you're wrong, and you know you are, but you get angry anyway? I know, you're not like that. I know. <laughs> I'm not even going to go into that. I was going to illustrate, but I just won't. I'm not going to waste your time, because you know, you know. Listen, if you're arguing at home, and you're arguing with your spouse, you're arguing with your kid, and you know that they already proved you wrong, and you keep arguing, something's wrong. You're Cain. And, and here he gets angry with God. Can you imagine getting angry with God saying, God, don't tell me I'm wrong. This is my order, not your order. This is my checkbook, not yours. This is my life, not yours. Just step out of my life. This is my thing. That's what Cain's saying. He's so angry with God. And, and, and so God's having a conversation with Cain. And he says, the Lord says to Cain in verse 6, he says, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. It's desirous for you, but you must roll over it. He sees the bitterness and the anger that's boiling up in his mind and heart, and he's saying, hey, listen, stop. My grace is extended to you. You made a mistake, but that's not the end of your life. Let's get things right and keep moving. But if you don't and you continue to keep a hard and bitter heart, Sin is at the door, and you're going to destroy everything. I give this advice in marriage counseling all the time. Marriage counseling is very simple. It's one person that's angry with the other, that can't stand the other person, that's just sick of the other person. And every time you smell or see or look or, or whatever, or you just hear them, you're, you're just like, there's something inside that gets you upset. And, and it, begun, it starts way back here where you're angry, and you let anger get the next step, and it holds on to you a little bit deeper. And then you let it get the next step, and it holds on. And next thing you know, it's gripping, and it's holding around you, and it's not letting you go. It's bitterness. Divorce is always caused from a bitter heart. You say, no, it's not. It's from an affair. Where did an affair come from? Yeah, it starts with your heart where you say, I need something. I'm going to order my life out, outside of my marriage to get what I want because I'm bitter with that person because they're not giving me what I want. That was another aside. I just keep going there. But that's the reality, and, and so, so Cain is, is having this conversation with God, and, and as Cain is going about his way, God is stepping in the middle here, stepping in his path and saying, listen, Cain, you need to stop right here. You're about to destroy everything. Stop. Just say you're sorry. Say you're wrong. You see where war begins? I must have control. They must look at me respectably. They must say that I'm good and that I'm right. They Listen, I don't care if it's even God himself that says I'm wrong. I would prove that I'm right. And so here's what Cain does in verse 8. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Very simply, Abel didn't do anything wrong. He was the victim. He was innocent. But Cain was so angry because God told him he was wrong that he had to take it out on someone. He's playing God. He's saying it's all about my order. James chapter 4, let's... Kind of go all the way over the New Testament. Um, this is a half-brother of Jesus, and he's writing some things. And this is a fascinating book. Um, <clears throat> a fascinating person, even. A person that didn't believe in Jesus until after Jesus died and rose again. And he's now saying, I believe in Jesus after the fact. And he's writing these things. And he says in chapter 4, James chapter 4, he says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? So why is there war going on? Where does this come from? Look, we know that, that people's lives are taken. People's lives are given to causes and things. But what is it that causes these wars? Where does it come back to? 
He says, is it not this, that your passions are at war within you, that inside of you, your passions are stirred up, they're going crazy. He says in verse 2, you desire and do not have, so you murder, you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel, you do not have because you do not ask, he says, and he's going then into a relationship with God and where we should be. But the the baseline of, of war and fighting is, I must have, and I'll take it if I have to. It comes from self-centeredness. It comes from ordering my, my life in the way that I want life to be ordered. Natural selection then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Do you see that? It's just caught in the middle. So, what's God's order? Because I think that's an important thing to get to. If you, time out, time out. If your home is filled with anger and bitterness, it's because of selfishness. It's because you are expecting that things go the way you want them to go. How do you know your way is right? And I know the other argument is, okay, but wait a second, wait a second. This is God's way. Okay. Okay. Are you being patient and long-suffering the way that God would want you to be? Are you insisting that the person do exactly as you expect or God expects at this moment? I find that God is extremely patient with his people. That's what the Bible is all about. Do you see it? It's you should do the right thing, and they keep messing up. We're a work in what? Yeah. Not, we, we were perfected yesterday. And we came to church today just to show off, right? Listen, if, if there's wars and fighting going on in your house, it comes back to self-centeredness. It's I want my, my way to be the, the way that it goes. I want my order to be the way that it goes. And you'll cause all kinds of stress, all kinds of agony and pain with people. You'll manipulate and control people to the degree that you will break them down and hurt them if you have to. I know you won't do it physically, but you'll do it emotionally. It's unbiblical. It's not loving, it's not kind, it's not God's order at all. So here's what God does. God speaks the truth all the way through and gives a very clear representation and a clear understanding of who he is. In John chapter 3, verse 16, the center point of the Bible, the thing that I believe everything points to this one thing. And, and we would know this, uh, many of us know this by heart because you went to Awan or you went to kids' church, whatever. For God, so what? Yeah, God loved the world. God loved the world. God continues to love the world. But he demonstrated that in a way very precisely, very clearly, back in, when Jesus came. And everything points to this. The center point of the, all the Bible points to the Messiah. Where the Old Testament says, I'm looking forward. I'm looking at this one that's coming. And then you have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's, he's here. And then you have Acts through the rest of the New Testament that says, He's coming back. And so here, Jesus, while he's here, here's what he does. He fulfills God's order. He fulfills what God wants him to do. He stepped into the world that that was simply run by dictators. Now, think about this. As far as control freaks go, back in that day, could could you imagine living in, in the the realm of being where Rome was with Nero and all the other things that were going on. This was a horrible time as far as dictators go. They would kill you just because they can, right? If you don't agree with their ideology, if you don't agree with what they are saying, if you don't agree with something, you're dead. No questions asked. I mean, you had different people that they would, they would like Herod in the Bible, he was one that, he was just a messed up individual. He killed most of his family because he was afraid they were going to kill him. It's like, well, I'll kill you before you kill me. Interesting times. Jesus comes in a time of injustice. Jesus comes in a time where the world is run by dictators. And so everyone is used to a world that's run by dictators, and everyone's used to being controlled by people, and that's how it goes. And Jesus' message is totally different than their message. His message is so outside of what the world stands for and what all the, the big, strong people are saying. He's saying, for God so... No, no, no. He didn't say, for God so dominated the world. For God so is more powerful than the world. 
while he is. For God so loved the world. Jesus says to to his friends, he says, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. Here is, we believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. He's not coming to lord it over. Listen, when he walks into the restaurant, here's what I would be thinking. Right? You walk into a restaurant, here's Jesus. Oh, wait, wait, wait. The son of God's arrived. He's at Applebee's. No, it's got to be better than that, right? Or wherever it is. And he walks in the door, and you've got a line that's three hours long, Texas Roadhouse. And, and you're there, and you're like, what's your wait? 90 minutes. And Jesus' and his disciples walks in the door, and he walks in, right? And everybody looks and says, there's the Son of God. Jesus is here. Listen, clear a place. He's sitting down. Why? Because he's bigger than all of us. But he says to them, no, 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 no. I didn't come to control. I didn't come to tell you, you know, how powerful I am. I came to serve. Man, that's a little different. That messes with all of our minds, and it messed with theirs back in that day. And the Pharisees and the religious people, they couldn't handle this. They're like, what's this guy? He's an idiot. Look, look I've got, I know how to order life because I've memorized most of the Bible. And I'm going to tell you what the rules are. And I have fences to back that up, right? And he comes in and he says, I love the world. I am serving the world. He loves the world so much. And, and by the way, can I, can I state this a little bit more accurately? Not that I'm uh, more contextually. When he says, for God so loved the world, what is he saying? For God so loved. And here's what John, who's writing this, should be saying. For God so loved the Jews. Because he's coming to his own people, right? Or God so loved the Gentiles. Or God so loved only the Americans. No, for God so loved what? The world. No one's excluded. And his love was an action that took Jesus to a cross. Where the world was against him, the world wanted him dead. They were shouting, even though they watched him him heal, they watched him just be a blessing in all of his life. And they shouted, and they pulled him in front of of Pilate, who said, I don't find any fault with him. His wife even warned him, hey, there's something with this guy. You better not do the wrong thing here. And, and, And so here he goes, and he washes his hands clean, says, I find no fault in him, but you want him dead, and I'll be the politician so that I can remain in control. That's all he does. And so eventually, Jesus then is crucified throughout that day. Jesus experienced, from Keith's message last week, he experienced the worst form of injustice. If anyone is going to cry out, this is not fair, it should be Jesus. If anyone is going to cry out back to God and say, this isn't fair, it should be Jesus, because he did nothing wrong, but yet he went to the cross for us. And so there he goes to the cross, and the world is spitting on him. The world is beating him. They're nailing him to a piece of wood that he created. And here's here's what I see. It's not that he's at war with the world. It's that the the world is at war with him. You see that? It's a flip. He came to love the world. He came to save the world. He came to serve. He didn't come to start war. And when Peter goes and he cuts off the soldier's ears, he's like, okay, now's the time. It's insurrection time. We're going to fight. Jesus, I got a sword. And he lops off the the soldier's ear. He he just looks at Peter and he's like, duh. It's not why I'm here. And puts the ear back on the soldier and they still take him away. The world is continually trying to get rid of God. From the time that Eve was in the Garden of Eden, there is a drive, a very hard and persistent drive to get rid of God. And God is saying, I love you, and I'm here to serve. So my question really today is, is where's your faith? do Do you trust God enough to allow God to order your life? Or you're standing up to God, shaking your fist at God as Cain did and said, listen, it's my way, it's my order, it's my, I want to do it my way. I don't care what you have to say about this, God. It's my life, it's my body, it's my rights, it's my money, it's my, 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 all the way down the line. 
A person that orders their life by God's measures will simply say, God, this is your resource. What do you want me to do with it? God, my body is yours. So God, how would you like me to be in this relationship? God, my finances, my wallet, I pull that out. It's all yours. What would you like to do with this? How would you like me to handle this? It's all of our resources, our time, it's everything. That's what it is to follow God. Next week, we're going to look at that a little bit deeper. Here's, here's the thing. Many people reject God because of war. When it is a natural selection kind of a process, it's fascinating. But they simply blame God for the atrocities that go alongside of war. And I'm here to say, it's not God's fault. It's not God's fault. God's been intervening and serving and loving for all time. And he'll continue to do that. So, as we conclude, how are you ordering your life? Are you following God's order? What's your marriage look like? What's your home look like? What's your neighborhood? What's your employment place? What do you look like in life? Is it following God's order or is it, you know what, I know God says be kind, but you don't understand how mean this person is. I know God says to serve, but you don't understand. They take advantage of me every time. They never said thank you. I know God says, but... Keep in mind, keep in mind, that people make lousy gods, and so do you. So do you. There's a a poem written um, around 70 years ago. Um, It it was etched into a wall. I heard about this past week at a concert I was at. Um, And the Holocaust is one of the most horrendous, um, traumatic episodes of war in modern history, I would say. Um, Within that, there are some amazing stories of bravery and heroism. In France, there was a Jewish family where they were hiding some um, concerned French nationalists in in their basement, and they were just protecting and, and different things there. And the Jewish family waited, and they waited for their deliverance. And at the end of the war, these words were found scribbled on the wall of that basement. It says, I believe in the sun, even when it does not shine. I believe in love, even when it is not given. I believe in God, even when he is silent. Mm, What powerful words. When 2011, composer Kim Andre Arneson put this to music in choral music, and so I was at a choral concert. And so I want to close our time together by watching um, this uh, choir sing this tremendous song. And I'll give you a moment to prepare yourself for the offering and, and such as well. It's a four or five minute song, and he'll stop it at the end of the song right before there's an applause for sure, and it goes on for a while. But it's a four or five minute song, and so let me just give you a chance to just kind of think through this a little bit. And if it's your first time, would you fill out the front and put that in the offering plate as they come around? And um, then if, if as a response to this message, I'll give you the opportunity to just respond and maybe have a question or a thought there. Um, uh, feel free to put that in and put that in the um, offering plate as it comes by. But I I want us to be thinking through these things. And my goal with this series is simply to say, if you're considering taking a step away from God, I I, want to just, I want to encourage you to pause. Just, have you thought through everything yet? Because there's a lot to think through. Have you considered all the different details that God's given? Because that's what I'm trying to get through here with you. Or maybe you know somebody that's considering stepping away from God. Before you do, I want to know where you're heading. I want you to understand where are you heading, where are you going, and pull you back. And if you feel, as I've heard a lot of people say, it's because God's silent in my pain. I feel like that person that's in the basement where everyone's abandoned them, and I feel like God is silent. And maybe the words in this song and the, the way they sing it will just touch your heart.
Just bow our heads in prayer. We ask, ask the ushers if you would come to the front. Lord God, thank you for who you are. Lord, even when we can't see the sun, we believe that the sun exists. And Lord, when we don't feel love, we believe that love exists. God, there's times where you are silent. We don't hear your voice. We don't see you working. We're in, sometimes in the middle of a, a, just a, so much pain. God, we believe you're there. Even when you're silent, we believe. So God, strengthen us in our struggle. Encourage us. Lord, for those that are just down and oppressed and hurting, Lord, may they reach out to you. Lord, please. Speak to us in those moments. Encourage us and show us who you are. Thank you, Lord, that we get to gather here. Thank you for all that you are doing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.